Welcome to this, the episode number 50 of the Rock and Roll Research Podcast, where we share the super cool backstories and side gigs of the research and insights pros that you trust. 50 episodes. I got to say, I'm kind of proud about that. I feel like Giannis dropping 50 points on the Phoenix Suns in game six of the NBA Finals this year. And when I think basketball, I think of Alfonso De La Noyes who is the co-founder and co-CEO of user experience research solutions company, UserZoom, who empowers businesses to win in the digital experience economy and also employs yours truly, your humble uh, podcast host. So thank you so much for that, Alfonso, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to get a slice of your time here, especially to be on the podcast. And and share your story, which which actually is a really interesting one. But before we get into the backstory, let's let's talk a little bit about research. So you've been involved in user experience research for longer than a lot of people knew it existed. So tell us how you got involved in it and and how you came to start UserZone. Yeah, it's been about um, well, not twenty five years, but maybe twenty three. Um, I think it all started back in the late 90s or mid to late 90s when, you know, the kind of the World Wide Web got started, right? Um, and the first websites were being built. And, you know, I was fortunate to be part of that journey. And, um, you know, this is, this is actually back in Spain because I went to school at San Jose State. And right. at San Jose State, they had computers with Netscape navigators. And, you know, we had <laughs> internet with yeah. the... I don't know if you remember the U.S. robotics modems. Um, oh, you know. yeah. <laughs> I do, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, I remember those those years. Uh, I went back to Spain after I graduated, and I helped the first, um, I, fir I helped enterprises, mostly bi large businesses, build their first websites, right? Uh, right. Retailers and, uh, and you know, brands in Spain. And everyone was so excited about it. But... Um, the issue was that no one cared about the end user experience. And of course, it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even called user experience back then. You know, some people talked about ergonomy or website ergon ergonomics, mm -hmm. um, human computer interaction, which, by the way, started way before uh, the World Wide Web and, and, right. and the market we're in right now. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I became very frustrated. I was a project manager and I became very frustrated on you know, with, with the lack of, um, let's just say, regard uh, for the end user and for the convenience and ease of use, which I thought it was sure. absolutely essential and, and very important because this is all new technology. Uh, at the same time, I was in love with the with with the work, with the web, right? The the, the right. concept of of being able to access uh, information like that, and um, so I guess I became passionate about how great the 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 World Wide Web was, but how but very frustrated on how websites were being built in those years. Mm -hmm. So I started going into the, 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 the research world and the, the testing, usability testing and doing qualitative research and then a little bit of quantitative and all that sometime around 1999 with a company called Icon Media Lab, which okay. uh, was one of the pioneering companies out there. And they had HCI or human computer interaction as part of the way that they built, they said, they claimed that they built uh, websites. It wasn't really done properly. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't done like it is today with a whole lot of testing, you know, before, during, and after the design. And right. so I went off, I went on my own and started a consulting company called Experience Consulting. This is in 2001. So it wasn't called user experience, but it was about experience. It was about experience. Um, marketing is kind of how we saw it you know like it's not just about you know technology it's about design it's, and so we started this consulting company in 2001 the same co-founders of user zoom and uh we were in the lab all day in a physical lab uh, right know, testing one by one and uh, it was a very interesting journey um uh, but long story short it was also very difficult and very costly and time consuming and everything was manual and nothing like it is today so that's what 
got us or motivated us to go um, uh, and build UserZoom, which was a product to automate and scale uh, user research and, and you know user testing. Uh, and that's that's where we are today. Yeah, great. So so it actually started as uh, an enabling technology for your consulting. That's right. Practice? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. We were uh, we were more of a services company before we were a technology or um, or a um, SaaS company. Okay. The model was to use our own product to deliver the insights, to deliver the the, the results uh, to, for our customers. And then it was, I think, in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. So like a couple of years in, uh, when we met with uh, a few guys here in the valley, because back then I was still in Spain, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a, a very uh, meaningful conversation with Google, who of course have been our customers for since then. Right. Uh, but I think he told us something like, you guys are great and you guys are great researchers and we love the results you guys give us, but we want the keys to the car. Can you somehow get us access to it? And yeah. that's, you know, SaaS model, right? Yeah. Which again, by the way, back in those years, SaaS was literally just like, you know, beginning stages, beginning stages of a model, like software right. as a service. And so then we started building a product that would be more, again, on demand and, um, you know, licensable, so to speak. Uh, it took us a couple of years to turn it all around. And yeah, that's, uh, that's how UserZoom got started. UserZoom as it is today got started, yeah. Okay, super cool. Now, now I know that when you were a wee lad uh, in Spain, right? <clears throat> you weren't thinking, oh, you know, someday I'm gonna, I'm gonna start a SaaS company in the user experience <laughs> space. Uh, you, you, had, you had a different dream, so, so tell us about that. I never thought I would be where I am today at all. My dream was to play in the NBA for sure. Um, but to be, to be honest, there's actually a connection uh, into all of this. That's, that's really cool. Um, I really wanted to play professional basketball, um, right. either in Spain or in the NBA back mm -hmm. in the day. And I really worked hard at it. And, you know, I, I thought I was pretty good uh, playing for the Real Madrid minor leagues. And then, uh, and then I went to high school uh, in San Diego, where I played uh, a couple of years of high school, junior and senior year, and did pretty well. And so I got recruited and I ended up getting a scholarship at San Jose State. Okay. So basketball led me to where I am today for, for, for various reasons. One, um, there's no way that I would have been able to afford, my parents would never have been able to afford a uh, university in the US without a scholarship. So basketball just right. basically enabled me to get an education international business and marketing um, to um, there's no way that I would have actually been here with user zoom unless I had spent you know many years because the reason I moved here is because of the three co-founders you know I could speak the language I knew the, knew the culture and initially right. it was going to be a couple of years uh, experience and then go back to Spain find a country manager and then go back to my nice life in Spain that was the original plan in 2008 uh, obviously it that that didn't work out that way. <laughs> yeah. Here we are, more than a decade later. So basketball enabled me to to get the education and to learn, you know, obviously the culture and and all that. Um, and last but not least, I think uh, I think it's been a fantastic uh, lesson for business because a lot of what you do in the on the court and you know a little bit off the court as well. But you know what you do with a team, uh, especially you know, kind of like a Let's just call it a competitive uh, level, like you know, Division sure. One college, Div Div Division One uh, basketball. Um, is that you learn that everything is about the team. There's no I in team. There's a lot of principles and values. Um, also, I was a point guard. I didn't, you know, I didn't really end up making it to the NBA. But you know, as a point guard, you're the extension of the coach, which would be compared to having a, you know the extension of the board is the CEO, right? Yeah. Uh, so you're you're kind of the leader um, and you're supposed to motivate people. And there's a lot of principles and values that you have. Obviously you have different egos uh, in the, in the locker room or in the team. Right. Um, there's, there's of course the concept of effort and giving it all up and being all in. There's no way you can earn a scholarship and be a division one basketball player unless you're really fully dedicated. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of those principles that, and I could go on to be honest with you for a full podcast dedicated to how basketball and business is, is a great combination. Sure. And so 
I never, I guess to wrap it up, I would say I didn't go to the MBA, but what I'm living right now, the journey we're going through in user Zoom, the growth, the opportunity, the competitive nature of being a, a, a high growth company, um, basketball enabled all of this. And I'm just super thankful that I received a scholarship and people trusted in me. And, you know, he, here we are today. Yeah, no, I, I have to make the connection, right? So I'm a, I'm a Timberwolves fan because I'm originally from St. Paul. So perhaps I think you're a little bit older than Ricky Rubio, who was drafted in the first round. Yeah, you know, another another Spanish point guard, but but maybe he took a little inspiration from you back in the day. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I mean, I don't think that I was that influential. And no, I think um, you know when you when you speak about Rubio, you speak about uh, a whole generation, um, including Pau Gasol, who just retired this week. Yeah, right. Um, you know, that generation was a basically ten years after my generation. You know, right. um, and. You know, it kind of made me feel a little bit bad because I really wanted to be in that type of group of guys, right? Um, yeah. But basketball wasn't that big until these guys actually made it big. I mean, they've, right. got, they've, won, they've won everything. This generation, Paul and Ricky and Juan Carlos Navarro and you know, yeah. a bunch of these guys, they won everything. And they've put basketball on the map like never before. Um, yeah. Maybe if you go back to the 84 uh, Los Angeles Olympics uh, and you had the silver medal, uh, the Spanish team played against Michael Jordan, Patrick Ewing, and they, they won the, the silver medal. That was a really good time for basketball in Spain. But then it went downhill big time. Right. And it was all about soccer. Um, so my generation, there wasn't, there wasn't really, to be honest with you, uh, uh, as much uh, hype. And what Ricky and, and Pau and these guys did is just phenomenal, phenomenal uh, influence. Uh, and they're also on and off the court. They're, they're, they're a bunch of, you know, great guys. Um, mm -hmm. So very much liked in the, in the country and, and around the world. And I think Ricky is a phenomenal passer. Just uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying what he's doing now. He's, he's becoming a lot more of a scorer. Yeah. You know. Uh, Changes so. the game. Yeah. 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 But he's, he finally became a decent shooter. So it took a while. <laughs> That's right. It That's took right. leaving Minnesota. <laughs> well, it's... it's it's very hard to improve your game when you're 25 or 27 or older yeah. and you have to change your game. You know, it, it's really difficult. It's not, it's nothing like being a teenager, you know? So yeah. kudos to him. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, so you've seen a lot of change and growth and evolution in this UX research space over the last, you know, 15 plus years. Oh yeah. Um, so as you kind of look into your crystal ball, uh, you know, what, what's important now or, or what do you see becoming important in the future? So I think that automation is so important. Um, I think you, you still need a lot of human touch and expertise and, um, you know, input to, to really dig in. But over time, there's no, there's no way that software doesn't really take over, right? It, it takes right. over on the, on the areas where it's not necessary that the human adds the input and the, and the, and the, and the um, you know, um, the analysis part, right? The analysis task. Right. So to be honest with you, since we started user Zoom, we were pretty, we were criticized by some, especially old school um, researchers Oh, you know, you don't, you know, you think uh, soft, you think software can do what user researchers do. That's crazy, and that's devaluing our and our 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 um our market, you know, and and our uh, space and our expertise. And I, no, no, all all we're trying to say here, like so, like it's happened with so many other uh, markets and and verticals, is that software can take can handle things that are just not. Um, are not, it's not efficient to have a human costly resource like a human being, a human researcher, right? Um, you know, uh, do so. What I can see is that we've gone through well, first of all, one of the best things that I've seen in the last decade is how much it matters to deliver great experiences and to deliver user centric designs and, and experiences. That wasn't the case back in the day. You know, the yeah. designers would want to do what they wanted to do, uh, or engineers would say users are stupid. 
you know, yeah. they got to, they gotta, why don't they just get it? And so over time, we've gone through a completely different uh, way of building software. And also the C-level executives are recognizing this as well. And so yeah. being, a, being in a C-suite myself, I know how hard it's been, and it still is, to really get the value and uh, you know, really properly appreciate it and, and dedicate the resources. That has changed. Now, as we continue on, because you have to make this scalable, right. um, my, my philosophy is do less research and make more decisions. Right. I don't think it's all about doing more and more and more and cranking more and more research and more studies and more. It's about the decisions that you make. That's what the researcher, they should be making decisions on what type of study to do based on the specific goal and what it is that you're trying to get to. Um, and then you need to interpret and, and analyze the data to come to meaningful, actionable conclusions. That I think is very hard for a machine to, to do. But everything else in the middle, can be automated in such a way that you make the researcher a, a ton more, a lot more efficient. So for instance, I can see artificial intelligence uh, playing a big role in sure. uh, analysis. Uh, I can see automation helping company, helping um, uh, researchers and non-researchers maybe that are also, are also participants, um, you know, with easy, easy, to, easy ways to get started and getting, you know, getting going. Um, because sometimes research is about understanding how to start, right? Um, yeah. How to get going. So I think in general, my, my answer to you would be that I, I can see a lot more research, a lot more testing happening, and I can see it embedded into the way that you build software anywhere, everywhere, for any company. You just, right. you know, why would you do research? Well, sorry, why would you build something like an app without doing the proper testing and analysis and research? you know, discovery research, and then of course the validation that goes through uh, during, the during the design process, and then the monitoring. Instead of just relying on MPS, you know, be get more, get, get deeper into the, into the uh, quality of that experience. Right. I, can see, uh, I can see automation and artificial intelligence helping and enabling uh, user experience professionals um, to, to deliver great experiences. Cool, cool, good stuff, good stuff. Uh, so this is a podcast, right? Uh, I'm presuming that perhaps there is a, uh, maybe some podcasts or other media that, that you consume for inspiration or enjoyment. Any, any sources that you might share with the people here? Wow, there, there's a lot. I mean, to be honest with you, um, you know, some of the, some of the business podcasts uh, I listen to, for instance, uh, there's a, a really, really cool growth podcast um you know they are a little bit research or, or research oriented but um but maybe not you know um so reed hoffman is one of my favorites uh he has this growth um podcast um i think it's called masters of scale um, yeah i think that's it yep yeah and you know i would tell you that Another of the, kind of going back to the other question, Matt, um, I think I can see as another trend is teams working together, teams that are not working together right now and they're in silos. And right. one of the best things that I think we could do is to have business people understand design and understand research mm -hmm. and vice versa. Researchers and designers to understand the essence or the basics of business. Because I think that sometimes there's a disconnect there. And really for me, having a great UX is, is, is two things. One is, is the best marketing strategy you can do to have a great product experience. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, this, and this area of product-led growth. And two, it's, it's it's your, it's, your, it's your business strategy. It's the UX for me is part of the business strategy, right? So if product is digital, um, you know, you, you got to have that, um, that idea of how the product experience impacts business. Yep. And what it, it's not just about making customers or users happy. It's about retention rates. It's about conversion rates. Exactly. It's about 
uh, you know, uh, expansion rates uh, in the economy, in the SaaS economy we're in, where you land and expand or you uh, have some users and then they, they move on to other things and, you know, you, you expand and you get what's called net retention rate. So I believe that uh, the masters of scale from um, uh, Reid Hoffman, you know, touches on a lot of things that are inter interesting about growth and, and product UX is just one of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> so uh, what I really want to know, so we've, we've talked a bit about uh, the UX space and, uh, and running a business in this kind of environment, a uh, bit about basketball, but what I really want to know, this is the Rock and Roll Research Podcast after all. Uh, and I see your shirt, it looks suspiciously like an Earth, Wind and Fire tour shirt. So what, what I really want to know, Alfonso, is you're, you're stranded on a desert island, away from user zone, away from the basketball court. Uh, you're going to spend the rest, <laughs> the rest of your, <laughs> painful, I know. Uh, you're going to spend the rest of your days there, but you have three records to choose uh, that will keep you company. What, what are those records? Yeah. Um, so I grew up uh, with, two parents that were very much into music. Uh, my dad was an opera singer uh, at some point. Oh, wow. <laughs> not, not for a long time, but yeah, that's that's why I was born in Italy. Um, even though I'm from Spain, I grew up in Spain. And then my mom was also a singer and piano uh, and you know a bunch of other people in the family. My brother, I have two older brothers. The one in the middle actually, you know, became a, a, a super famous musician in Spain back in the 90s. Um, super talented. So I just grew up, I'm, I'm the, I'm the smallest one, right? I was a, I was like a, I was a mistake, you know, I wasn't supposed to be born. I was like you know, <laughs> at 12 years older than me and 10 years older than I came. It was a surprise. Uh, but my brothers are way older than me. And so I listened to a lot of seventies and eighties music growing up. Right. And, uh, and also, uh, a very versatile, uh, range, a, a wide range of music styles and genres and all that. So I'm a huge music person. Um, I can go to Metallica and I can go to Rachmaninoff, right? And, and take off. <laughs> right. And, you know, so the three records I would like, I would take are very different, very, very different because of, it's going to, it's, got, it's, it's like research. It's going to depend on your goal and your situation. You may want <laughs> to play one or the other. <laughs> I, I think one of the best um, ever is uh, Dark Side of the Moon by uh, yeah. Pink Floyd. Very nice. It's one, of those, it's one of those that any song of that record at any time will still, you know, give me the, the goosebumps. Very nice. And uh, yeah, it's just like timeless design, well, timeless music. And then going back even further, uh, I'd go for the piano concerto number two of uh, Rachmaninoff. Uh, ah. He, yeah, that, that's, it's not as famous as others like, you know, Tchaikovsky or Beethoven or Mozart, of course. I'm also a big fan of those guys, but that number two is just so incredibly, it's the romantic period, you know, and it's just incredible how, how intense that is. Mm -hmm. I listen to it a lot as well. And it happens exactly the same as, as the dark side of the moon. I can never get tired of it. It's just perfect. And the last but not least, yeah. So these guys, um, they are also incredibly influential, Earth, Moon, and Fire. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I would have to take, I mean, it's very hard to pick one of their albums. They have so many and it's like <laughs> picking one of your kids, but <laughs> Um, but I think the, the greatest hits, the, the one that has the, um, the album that has it's red and it has the, yeah. you know, the gold, um, cover, um, is, is just phenomenal. Um, so, so yeah, the, I, if I took those three and maybe if I didn't have users or more basketball with those three, it will make my life easier probably <laughs> in a desert <laughs> island. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. Well, I appreciate you sharing your your insights and your journey, uh, and uh, a little bit about your your hobbies, getting a chance to look under the hood of of Alfonso a little bit. So, appreciate that. Uh, look forward to con continuing this journey here at User Zoom. Thanks so much, Alfonso. And rock and roll. Absolutely, rock and roll. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. <laughs>